thank you all very much. Please be seated. I know you're all admiring my suntan. <laughs> you two can look like this, just sit out in the sun. <laughs> as long as I did. Well, first and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation to Ambassador Mittendorf and Norm Kurland and the members of the task force for the time and effort they contributed to this project. You know, scientists say a perpetual motion machine is impossible. Well, considering that this task force completed its work without any appropriation from Congress, I think we ought to introduce Bill Mittendorf to a few scientists. <laughs> uh, the American character, and that's what we're talking about, is no accident, no fluke of nature. It was nurtured by the political and economic liberty that has been hailed and protected by generations of Americans. It's the source of power that turned a vast wilderness into an economy that has provided more opportunity and a higher standard of living for more people than any other in the history of mankind. Today, the pivotal relationship between freedom and economic progress is becoming ever more important. The root cause of stagnation in the developing world clearly is not a lack of resources, but a lack of freedom. In so many countries, what will change despair into confidence, deprivation into plenty, Stagnation into upward mobility is a commitment to human freedom and an understanding of how that relates to the economic progress of mankind. You know, I have a recent hobby. I have been collecting stories that I can tell or prove are being told by the citizens of the Soviet Union among themselves, which display uh, not only a sense of humor, but their feeling about their system. One of them has to do with the fact that in the Soviet Union to buy an automobile, as a private citizen, you have to wait 10 years for delivery of the car. And so this story has this one individual going through all the agencies and bureaus that he has to go through with regard to the purchase, and finally he's at the last place where they stamp the paper. And then, 10 years in advance of delivery, he must put up the money, and give him the money for the car. And the man then that had made the final stamp of the paper, taken the money, said, all right, come back in 10 years and get delivery of your car. And he said, morning or afternoon? <laughs> and the fellow the fella said, well, 10 years from now, what difference does it make? Well, he said, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> Far too many third world countries are immobilized by the policies that smother individual initiative and drain the private sector of resources. Instead of controlling the energies of their people, lesser developed countries should be freeing up and unleashing those energies. There's no reason to believe that the citizens of most countries with struggling economies are not as bright and hardworking and capable as those in countries which are enjoying great progress like on the Pacific Rim. There's been a crying need, however, for creative and innovative thinking in regard to economic growth in Central America. And that's where the Task Force for Project Economic Justice comes in. We're all aware that Central America is today on the front lines of the battle for human freedom. The security of our country and the stability of the hemisphere are tied to events in that volatile region. The people of Central America, and in a broader sense, the entire developing world, need to know firsthand that freedom and opportunity are not just for the elite, but the birthright of every citizen. That property is not just something enjoyed by a few, but can be owned by any individual who works hard and makes correct decisions. That free enterprise is not just the province of the rich, but a system of free choice in which everyone has rights, and that business, large or small, is something in which everyone can own a piece of the action. I've, I've long believed that one of the mainsprings of our own liberty has been the widespread ownership of property among our people, and the expectation that anyone's child even from the humblest of families, 
could grow up to own a business or a corporation. Thomas Jefferson dreamed of a land of small farmers, of shop owners and merchants. Abraham Lincoln signed into law the Homestead Act that ensured that the great western prairies of America would be the realm of independent, property-owning citizens. A mightier guarantee of freedom is difficult to imagine. I know we have with us today employee owners from La Perla Plantation in Guatemala. They have a stake in the place where they work and a stake in the freedom of their country. When communist guerrillas came, these proud owners protected what belonged to them. They drove the communists off their land, and I know you join me in saluting their courage. I can't help but believe that in the future we'll see in the United States and throughout the Western world an increasing trend toward the next logical step, employee ownership. It's a path that then... It's a path that benefits a free people. Walter Ruther was one of the first major labor, labor leaders to advocate that major or that management and labor shift away from battling over wage and benefit levels to a cooperative effort aimed at sharing in the ownership of the new wealth being produced. He was looking far beyond the next contract. There's a story that Ruther was touring a highly automated Ford assembly plant when someone said, Walter, you're going to have a hard time collecting dues, union dues, from all these machines. And Ruther simply shot back, not as hard a time as you're going to have selling them cars. <laughs> Ruther was killed in a tragic plane accident in 1970, so he didn't live to see the passage of legislation sponsored by Senator Russell Long of Louisiana that provides incentives for employee stock ownership plans or as we call them, ESOPs. In recent years, we've witnessed medium-sized and even some large corporations being purchased in part or in whole by their employees. Lowe's companies in North Carolina, the Milwaukee Journal, the Lincoln Electric Company of Cleveland, Ohio, and many others are now manned by employees who are also owners. The energy and vitality unleashed by this kind of people's capitalism, free and open markets, robust competition, and broad-based ownership of the means of production can serve this nation well. It can also be a boon, if given a chance, to the people of the developing world. Nowhere is the potential for this greater than in Central America. Members of my staff described for me the overwhelmingly positive response your task force received when it floated this idea during a visit to Central America that debt payments can be reduced, state-owned businesses privatized and made more efficient, and employee ownership expanded, all as part of a mutually reinforcing plan. And that's an exciting idea. I'm instructing the appropriate officials in our administration to take a close look at all of the task force's recommendations and to move on those that can be put into practice. Well, the Founding Fathers Jefferson, in particular, did not see economic and political freedom as the right only of the citizens of the United States, but the right of all people everywhere and for all time. Today, the free people of the United States and Central America face a great challenge. I have every confidence that together we'll meet the test and that freedom will not only survive but triumph. The work of this task force should help bring about that triumph. Thank you all for what you're doing. God bless you all.